What a wonderful welcome. Thank you so much for that. I'm Stan Grant. It's fantastic to be with you here live from the Illawarra Performing Arts Centre in Wollongong. Like many coastal areas, this region is experiencing a population boom brought on by COVID. We'll be talking about that. Joining me on the panel, the Mayor of Wollongong, Gordon Bradbury. Business Executive, Diane Smith-Gander. Labor MP for Whitlam, Stephen Jones. Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University of Sydney, Lisa jackson Pulver and Liberal MP for Goldstone, Tim Wilson. Please make them all feel welcome. Uh, hi, Stan and panel. Uh, I'm from the South Coast. With the recent scare, scare in our area and the current outbreak in Melbourne, should this be a wake-up call to our government that we need to start moving the vaccines out quicker do we need to look at having multiple COVID vaccine hubs in regional and country areas? I might go to you, Gordon Bradbury, on, on this. Um, the experience here in Wollongong, more broadly in the South Coast, regional areas, in getting the vaccine and questions about quarantine. What more can be done? Well, from my perspective, anyway, I, I just it seems a very clunky exercise. I... There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to it at times, and uh, it depends on which part of Australia you're from. But when we had the situation down here where we had uh, the possible uh, spread of infection here, the community did respond pretty fast, and uh, the local hospital became a focal point as well as setting up other uh, testing centres. <coughs> so it is is possible to act fast, but when it comes to the vaccination, that's another story because... Uh, we haven't handled the issues of the so-called clotting factors that influence the AstraZeneca uh, rollout. Uh, then, of course, uh, the Pfizer is the, the uh, held up as the ideal, but at the same time, it, the messaging around it hasn't helped. And with respect to our po political leaders, I think we've blurred scientific and medical advice and then we also had the political advice somewhat intermingled and I think it should have been separated. It should have been done more clearly with the scientific medical advisors doing the front work and being the, the messages, uh, messages of, the, of how it was to be administered. It, it seems to me that it's created a lot of confusion. The only thing that saved us is basically, as far as I'm concerned, is that is we've put borders up and we've been really strict in terms of managing outbreaks and that mm. saved us. It isn't... And the other thing that is concerning me is the fact, unless we get our populations vaccinated, then there's an opportunity for variants to uh, pop up. And not only that, that period between the first and second vaccines needs to be really strictly managed. And that's concerning me as well. And then, of course, those with disabilities, aged care facilities and so on. It doesn't seem to have a coherence about it that builds confidence in the community. Lisa jackson um, as well as your position uh, at Sydney University, you're also an epidemiologist. Yep. When we look at, at vaccine, um, we're always told the vaccine was the magic bullet, wasn't it? That gets us to the other side, that gets us to a COVID normal. Gordon has just outlined some of the frustrations. I know that people in the room here are frustrated and confused about this as well. But do you think we're getting some momentum now? I think we're understanding as an Australian community that COVID is here and that we can't be complacent. We've seen what's happened overseas. Um, there's very few people who may have connections overseas that wouldn't have stories of someone who's passed away or someone who's been diabolically mm. unwell. We've been very, very fortunate. We've missed it. Um, what we are looking at very closely and what I think we should be doing better is applying the lessons that we've learnt over the last 12 months. There's been exquisite, priceless learnings that I think are being missed. You know, that we have got a COVID vaccine rollout that's got a few hiccups those hiccups are going to be very, very difficult to retract from unless we learn straight away. Things like going into aged care facilities and not having 100% of the people there uh, vaccinated within the time frame of the two vaccination shots. Um, and that means the staff, that means the, the frontline staff, the nursing staff, the carers, the cooks, the cleaners, the drivers, the bus people. It has to be the whole kit and caboodle. And it can't be this ad hoc process where 
oh, great, we've got some leftover vaccines, let's get them in the arms of health workers who may not have a mm. second vaccine booked. Because the thing works and the efficacy of the vaccine is based on two shots, not one. So this whole story has to be a little bit better coordinated yeah. um, and I think we need to get very serious about it. Winter is here. Can I just ask, if, if you don't mind, could I have a show of hands, how many people in the room have not had the vaccine, fully vaccinated, have not had? Wow. And, and have, have had, hands down, one, two, three, four, maybe... Maybe half a dozen or a bit, or a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we know that there are, you know, there are circumstances here. There are different rollouts. There are different age groups. There are different vaccines. But, uh, Tim Wilson, does it raise the question about a need for some incentive? We've seen this in other parts of the world. The United States is even running a lottery. You get a million bucks if you get your vaccine. Um, is, is, is there a need for, a, um, for, for some more incentive? I'm not convinced that there's more incentive for individuals. I suspect that the people who haven't had their hands up before saying they haven't got it, uh, the overwhelming majority would be encouraged to get it and would be happy to get it, not just to take care of themselves, um, but their sense of responsibility towards others. Um, and that's something that's obviously a very live conversation uh, in Victoria right now. But, you know, I think there are ways you could establish incentives with some of the providers to deliver um, uh, vaccine rollouts probably a bit more efficiently so that they meet benchmarks um, to make it attractive. But I think for most people who want to do the right thing and want to be vaccinated so we can return to a COVID normal, I'm not sure that a, an incentive is going to do much. The only concern I have is there is this not, not an insignificant section of the population who are vaccine hesitant. And uh, there's a number of factors that play into it, from uh, particularly mm. the concern around uh, unintended consequences, um, with, uh, with the, particularly associated with the AstraZeneca mm. um, and the side effects uh, uh, around AstraZeneca. And so, but I don't think an incentive is going to get over that. I think it's about building a sense of confidence in these vaccines and that where there are side effects, they can be addressed. And that's the role of epidemiologists, nurses and doctors to consult with their patients if they do have hesitancy. But uh, as someone who has got one of the vaccines, um, I can only encourage people to do so. Are people in the room concerned Hesitant? Concerned? Hesitant? No, no, no. That, yeah, yeah, there's some. Yeah, yeah. That, it's a mixed bag. Yeah, it, 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 it is a mixed bag. I and think Diana, I'm, I'm, changed I'm though a little bit. There's not as much hesitancy as there was before. I think Victoria has taught anyone who was hesitant that they, we can't be hesitant. Well, we've seen, we've so seen, much we've seen a spike, haven't we? Now. We've seen but a spike in vaccines after the... Exactly. Can, can I go and to we've you? been told that there's a supply problem. And so, you know, across Australia, people are thinking, hmm. well, people in aged care haven't had it yet. My mother only had her first jab on the 26th of May just last week. I got mine earlier, my brother, and, you know, a month before, two months before. So we've been told there's a supply problem, and so we're doing that family hold back thing. It's not my turn yet. I think we really need some very consistent and unified communication. What I think Australians want is our leaders to stand up and give us some clear communication. And forget about whether... <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Let's forget about whether it's the federal government mm. or the Labor government, the Liberal here, the state, this and that and the other. We should just be very clear that our best defence is a vaccine rollout and the next best thing is our quarantine and how are we going to move mm. towards that? And Simon, you are so right. It should be everywhere. We should be aspiring to get out of hotel quarantine entirely. But we need to frame this properly so that people will understand, I think Australians are smart, they'll understand the messages, they'll go out and get the vaccine. Stephen Jones, I'm just wondering why we don't hear definitively that once we get to... X percentage of the population, 75, 80, I don't know what the percentage would be. Once we get to that percentage of the population with the full vaccination, once we have the quarantine, we can make a, a definitive promise that there'll be no more lockdown, that the borders will be open, that we'll be living with COVID rather than trying to, to shut ourselves down and avoid any COVID, which in a world where it is going to be around for a long time would be impossible. Yeah, look, I think... Getting back to your original question, should we put in, should we have incentives on the table? I think the best incentive is keeping yourself 
your family and your neighbours safe. Correct. Keeping our hospital wards empty, mm. uh, ensuring that as a community we can return to normal. I wouldn't rule out some of the things you're talking about down the track, but frankly, the biggest issue we have at the moment is supply and getting the supply chain sorted. I imagine there'll be plenty of people in the audience who've rung up for their jab and been told maybe a week, maybe two weeks, maybe a month. It's a lot of nodding. Or you're, you're, not in, you're not in the category. I'm sorry, you don't fit a category. Or which, or which one you can or get. Which one, yeah. And I actually want to, to the point that a couple of people... We've got two, two good vaccines that are available. Yeah. They're both safe. They're both world-class vaccines. Um, and I think it's incumbent on people like me and Tim and other community leaders to be instilling confidence in the community mm -hmm. based on the medical evidence that is available. The other thing we can do to instill confidence is to ensure that if we're telling everyone to go out and get the jab, that the government's done its bit by ensuring the su supply chain is made available. I'd have done it differently. Um, I'd have had more mass vaccination hubs and I'd have had the, the closest max max vaccin max mass vaccination <laughs> hub. I'll get there eventually. <laughs> <laughs> to Wollongong is Sydney, um, where the third biggest city in New South Wales. You've got to travel two hours mm. to get to the closest hub. So I'd have put them in large regional areas. I probably would have worked more closely with the New South Wales and the state governments who do vaccination programs every day of the week and use the GP network as a backstop, not a mm. main stop. Mm. Um, and then I think we've also got a role as leaders, as I said, to ensure that we're running the PR campaigns and ensuring that the things that we say are adding to confidence, not detracting mm. from it. Could I just throw in yeah. another, another bit that really did concern me? And suddenly when we had the first case of a negative reaction to a AstraZeneca, it suddenly was headlines. And, and as, uh, it was not put into context. And trying to get the statistical message across to the Australian community that this was an aberration and a statistical aberration of, of a, a level that didn't warrant the amount of media attention that was focused upon... <laughs> that, that, that's, that's what caused... That, can I just finish? That's what caused the problem. And, and I really think that we've, we need to tidy up the messaging about how we handle this pandemic and also especially the rollout of the uh, vaccinations. Mm. But using those statistical aberrations, the way the media highlighted that and, and in such a way as just instill fear in people, I've got a greater chance of being eaten by a shark off Wollongong Beach than I have dying of COVID, <laughs> of, of COVID vaccination. <laughs> I'm a mother and full-time carer for two of my children living with disabilities. They're both NDIS participants and we have paid carers in our home every single day. There's been no urgency or duty of care from our government to protect people with disabilities from COVID-19. Our aged and disabled populations are still not all protected with vaccines. The workers who work with them are not vaccinated. And sadly, our government has no accurate figures on the vaccine rollout in the disabled population. Why have people with disabilities been an afterthought in the vaccine vaccination process, despite being prioritised in the rollout plan? Mm. Tim. <laughs> Tim Wilson, this is, um, this is the burden of government that a lot of these questions are, are falling sure. to you here tonight. But can, can I just add something to that in terms of numbers? And this, this surprised me, I have to say. Uh, Senate estimates just this week. For people living in disability care, just 355, or about 1.6% of more than 22,000 residents have received both doses. How can that happen? Well, as, as everyone's aware, there's stages to the vaccine rollout based on the degree of need and the risk of what would happen. Shouldn't this Should be a priority, though? Well, well, I, mean, I understand there's stages, but you're hearing here from someone who's absolutely connected to this. Mm. It's, but, it's, it's not a question of stages, it's a question of priority, isn't it? Well, that, it is a question of priorities and the people who get the priority first and have got the priority first are those most at risk of very severe health conditions if they attract COVID-19. People's disabilities don't automatically equate to that challenge and there are young people who have a higher risk in comparison to some older people in other sections of the population. The best opportunity or the best outcome that everybody would like, I suspect, on this panel and for the for the most part in the audience here, is to be vaccinated yesterday. But when we have to 
provide supply over a time frame that actually makes sure we target different sections of the population based on their risk profile, it will move progressively. And as we move through different stages, we start ne the next different stage and continue to go down. Because of course, a lot of the younger people in the room, because of their risk or diminished or low risk profile, won't have been vaccinated. So it's a stage rollout um, and people with a disability are a critical part of that conversation. Um, but there are other subsections of the population with a higher risk profile that get a more urgent... Fiona, Fiona Look, I, I'm I, really I, I, can, sorry, can, can, can I just go back to Fiona for a moment? <laughs> then, then, then I'll come yeah, to you, Diane. Thanks. Fiona, you were shaking your head about that. What does that answer say to you? Well, my understanding is that people with disability were in phase 1B of the rollout mm. and residential care was included in that as well as disability carers working in private homes. So I, all of my carers should have been vaccinated by now. I'm the only one who has been. And, and as outlined before, we've had, we've had some supply issues into Australia. No one's disputing that. That's been very public. Um, but we don't wait for one stage to finish to start the next one, because if we did, it would take even longer for them to be able to access supply. And it would be take even longer for those in different subsections of the population. So the objective is to get people vaccinated as quickly as possible and to make sure that this period ends as quickly as possible. I just don't agree. Diane. It's very hard for us to take an answer like that seriously. Lisa said we need to get serious <laughs> about and I'm sorry, I, I, I am usually not the critical person. I'm usually the measured lady with the grey hair. But as I said, my mother in aged care received her vaccine on the 26th of May and fully two months before that, my 30-something Pilates instructor received her vaccine as a frontline health worker and that circle doesn't square to me. Mm -hmm. And I think we all have experiences like this which make us think that the best minds are not being put to the issue of getting this roll out back up the S-curve. Because as a business person, I know that take-up will follow an S-curve if you work hard at it. And we're bumping along the bottom. We need to change the way we're dealing with this to absolutely accelerate our rates of vaccine. Otherwise, at the end of next year, we'll still be waiting. Well, there was actually took 45 days to issue the first million doses. It's now in the tens to issue the fourth. So we're continuing to move through rapidly. And you're 100% right, it's going on a curve and it's getting yeah, much we faster. we need it to go like this, well, not like that. As I said at the start, the best day we could have everybody vaccinated was yesterday, but we're going to keep working at it to make sure that's the case. But if we wait for one stage to be finished before we start the next stage, then no, that will be going for many, many years versus getting every single bit of it moving as quickly as possible. I still want my mum done before the Pilates instructor. Sorry. Well, <laughs> and, I, and I want people with disabilities who should we have all been want people done. With disabilities. Yeah, who should have been done. <laughs> and if it was just people with disabilities, you'd say, this is a stuff up. Um, how are we going to fix it? But it's not just people with disabilities. It's aged care. Yep. It's people with disabilities. It's frontline health workers. It's frontline workers right across the economy. All the people who we've been lectured to to get out from under the doona, um, the thing that's going to get us out from under the doona is getting the vaccine supply and all the logistics sorted. The one thing the Commonwealth said, we've got this, we're going to do it, is the one thing that they've stuffed up. Can, can I, I just say, though, that's... You know, of course, in opposition, you get to, to raise those questions. But an extraordinary time to be in government, isn't mm. it, to deal with a, a once in a hundred years sure. pandemic such as this. Mm. And while we talk about the things that are going wrong, we're in this room here tonight having this mm. conversation. Australia has been spared, mm. thankfully, the worst of this. And now we're getting to the stage where we can see potentially beyond this. There have been some achievements, haven't there? Yeah, and I absolutely... You might have heard me earlier saying hotel quarantine was actually a sensible solution when you're running at a million miles an hour trying to sort out a problem and you can't start building quarantine centres and have them stood up in, in a week's time. So I'm not criticising everything, but the one thing the Commonwealth said, we've got this, this is our responsibility, get out of the way, states, we're going to do that, was the vaccine rollout. And it's the one thing they should have said, well... Who, roll, who runs vaccine programs in this country? You know, week in, week out, year in, year out. States do it and they do it damn well. Let's work with them more closely. Let's use their infrastructure. Yes, GPs have a role. They should have been the backstop, not the front stop. And we absolutely should be getting into those at-risk populations 
our friends, our community in aged care, in disability services, in group homes, and ensuring that they were absolutely at the front of the queue, and it's a disgrace that they haven't been. But Stephen, if you're going to judge everything against perfection... <laughs> Stephen, if you're going to judge everything against perfection, right now we have a break. No, I'm not, I'm not doing well, that. Well, politely you are. If you go and look at the Victorian circumstance, right now we have an outbreak, and frontline health workers, ambulance officers in Victoria, only half of them have been vaccinated by the state government. It is going to take time. It, people will always find that frustrating as an answer. I completely understand why, because we want people to be vaccinated. But I'm not going to sit here and lecture the Victorian government and say they have failed every step of the way because frontline health workers, including sometimes people who go out and pick up people who may be suffering very serious conditions associated with COVID-19, have failed. It's about building confidence, as we've discussed before, encouraging people to do it, providing the pathway for people to be able to, because the objective, again, of everybody in this panel, and I would hope of the Australian population, is to get the nation vaccinated as quickly as possible. Perfection's not the standard. Doing what you said and promised you were going to do okay. is the standard, and I think that's a reasonable standard to hold you to. Good evening. On Mabo Day, I would like to recognise the Wadi Wadi people of the Darwell Nation. This question... <laughs> this question is on behalf of our school leaders, including our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander prefect. Recently, in our local community, we have started a petition calling for the government to act on the Uluru Statement from the Heart, calling for a voice to Parliament and a Makarata Commission. People within our community have shown great support for this issue. And as voters in the next election, we ask why the government refuses to take action on such a vital element of reconciliation, considering that this year's theme of Reconciliation Week centres around action. Michael. Thank you for that question, Michael. As, as someone whose great-great-grandfather was a... Darawal man, thank you as well for that, that acknowledgement. We have some Darawal people in the room with us as well. It's nice to see you here. Mm -hmm. I want to go to you first on this, Tim Wilson, because your journey's been interesting on, on when it comes to recognition and, and recognition in the Constitution, trying to see how marry that to a conservative approach to politics as well. Tell us about that. I think you're confusing me with somebody else. I'm not a conservative, I'm a liberal. <laughs> um, and I say that very deliberately. Um, and. <laughs> I've always started from the position of trying to understand the challenges and the, the faced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and the silence. I was very moved by, I think it was a quarterly essay a few years ago uh, written by Noel Pearson about mm. the concept of the elephant and the mouse mm. and um, what that meant. But then how do you move a discussion from um, what was proposed, that was then proposed as pre Uluru into something that was practical, what I call going through the liberal lens, because it had been through the conservative lens about the architecture of mm. the constitution, to what is the liberal lens which assesses um, how do we make a society whole and make everybody feel included um, and be full participants within our society. So uh, the challenge we have is making sure we have something that is going to be uh, put either to the parliament or the people that is going to pass because I don't think that there is any way that any of us would ever live, with, I think, with the scars that would come if it were put to be put to the, particularly to the people and were defeated. As uh, I lived through the debate on the legal definition of marriage um, and it was very challenging for a lot of people, um, but one of the reasons that some of us were so confident of a public process is because we knew we would win because the arguments would win. I think the work that hasn't been done on uh, the Uluru Statement or what's the practical derivative of that uh, hasn't been one to the same scale. And people will debate that, uh, but I think it's, we want to have a proper conversation so that it gets the outcome that people want. And yet on, on your own side of politics, we saw that the Uluru Statement from the Heart was rejected and we heard all of those claims at the time, which people have since walked back, that this was a third chamber or that somehow this was antithetical to liberalism, mm. that you can't recognise a distinct group of people in a society where we are individuals and not you can't recognise race in the constitution. How did you square that, that issue? Well, well, that was never my view, um, but it's... Uh... In the end, we've got to be a more complete nation at the end of whatever process is mapped out where people feel that they're recognised, understood, and there are different parts of it. There's obviously the discussion around the voice to parliament uh, and then there's also the Makarata Commission, which is the Truth-Telling Commission, which 
um, can exist regardless of what happens with the constitutional I'm not saying expense of, but regardless. And I actually support that mm. because I think if you're going to go through a process of healing, you have to have a start with acknowledging past and truths so that people can then walk on a journey together. And that, that in itself may be one of the bases in which you can then have a conversation about what follows. The concern that I have, and I've outlined already, is putting something to the people that's yeah. defeated. And I still have reservations about the consequences of putting something in the Constitution, whereas if it were to be legislated, I would be much more relaxed. Lisa jackson um as an Indigenous person as well, can you speak to the, the sense we, we've been here so many times before, mm. haven't we? This question of recognising Indigenous people was, was put to, uh, to the people before. We've had various false starts when it comes to recognition or treaties. What is the sense, and I know you can't speak for your entire Indigenous population, no. but what is the sense amongst Indigenous people right now about where this process is at? Uh, in where I'm from, my world, it's very much around, can we just crack on with this? It's been 230 plus years, never seated. <laughs> never seated, never sold, no treaties. Um, People are asking, what do we need to do about Aboriginal people or Indigenous matters? A lot of people came together and has put an enormous amount of love and time and conversations and interrogated some very heavy questions and came up with this document, this recommendation that is probably one of the... Um, biggest endeavours of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across the land because of the multitude of voices that contribute to that. And then somehow that is still not enough. Mm. I don't know where the line of enough is. Let's go backwards. We had a royal commission. We've had black deaths in custody. We've had national inquiries. We've had the National Aboriginal Health Strategy. We've had these things over generations, over decades, over centuries. And then people come together and come up with a beautiful roadmap. It's superb, absolutely superb. You want to know what we need to do? We need to do that, without question. Stephen Jones. La Labor is committed to implementing the Uluru Statement, but at the same time there is a process already underway um, and, and a move perhaps towards a legislated voice for Indigenous people rather than a constitutionally enshrined voice to, to Indigenous people. Is that process going to get ahead of where the Labor Party is? We'll consider that when it comes before the Parliament. I want to start by thanking Michael and the, the students at my old school, actually, for um, the activism you've taken to this. And I see there's a bunch of school groups in... I see Mr Fitzy up there in his AIM T-shirt, which is great, from Dapto High, and a, a <laughs> bunch of different uh, schools here. I think the young people are way ahead of us old fogies on this, yeah, and I, I think that's really exciting. Um, with respect to Tim, and I actually think he's a person of goodwill on this particular issue... Um, I think we get off on the wrong foot if we start seeing this through a liberal lens or a labour lens. I think we've got to see this through the lens of human decency and history <laughs> and, the... and to borrow some words from Tony Abbott, who I actually thought put it very eloquently, this is unfinished business. Mm -hmm. We've got to get this done. Um, and my own party... in embarked on it. We were very, very hot on the recognition stuff and we put a lot of energy and work into the recognition stuff. And then the Uluru process took off and that was quite challenging for us because we thought, well, we're going down this way. The mob are going in a different direction. We met with uh, the, the authors of the Uluru Statement at Uluru at the, on the final day of the ceremony and we said, well, actually, this is a better process and we've got to do it. And that's why we've signed up to it, because we think it's about decency, it's about getting it right, and it's not about yeah. talking to Aboriginal people, it's about listening. Could I, I also... Think I, could I also... Just, just, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, just a quick one. I think uh, Tim's on the right path in as much that the div challenge here is putting into referendums and trying to get a re change to the Constitution and those sorts of things. Uh, that is fraught. What we need in this country is a Bill of Rights. 
Mm. And that will highlight the fact that what we've done to the Aboriginal uh, and Torres Strait Islander people in this nation is recognised as absolutely horrific and wrong, and then you've got some basis on which you can then argue for the change of the Constitution. The but the Bill of Rights is if, the place If to we're going to start debating a Bill anyway, of Rights, Tim, we may be here all night. <laughs> all night. Yes. Yes. I but, but, but can I just Let's clarify that? Stephen has completely mischaracterised what I was talking about. In fact, you, go, you asked the question about and, and, my own journey. And, and, what and, I was, and, you, and you were talking as a philosophical, philosophical liberal based. rather than a capital it's, L it's, liberal. Because I, I agree with you. The, the basis of this is anchored in a sense of human dignity um, and always has been, but people can approach it from different ways based on... And if you want to take everybody a journey, you have to start from understanding where people sit, mm. including Aboriginal, obviously Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, but the rest of the community to take and walk them on that journey and people have different perspectives on how they get to the end road. I and would put uh, that you have to listen first. The correct. voice must come first. Please thank our panel, Gordon Bradbury, Diane Smith-Gander, Stephen Jones, Lisa Jackson-Porber and Tim Wilson.